Please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This morning we're going to be moving around a little bit. As we're looking at some of the spiritual gifts, we have entered into a, a discussion that began last time on the gift of tongues. And the gift of tongues is considered the controversial gift among everyone along the spectrum. And probably the primary reason for this is in the area of personal experience. It is dangerous in our present day to critique or evaluate, to criticize or to be skeptical or otherwise raise questions or concerns about another person's experience. Personal experience is viewed in our modern culture as ultimate. It is therefore truth, their truth, and is not to be questioned. But scripture says that we are to test all things, including our own experience and the experience of others, especially when the experience does not align with the clear teaching of the Bible. I want to reiterate a little bit about what we talked about last time. There are a number of arguments that people who believe that modern tongues is a continuation of the gift of tongues that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 through 14. And it is normally argued, and this is perhaps one of the strongest arguments that they, they have, according to, to them, is that the, the tongues that you see in the book of Acts, especially Acts chapter 2, chapter 10, verse, and chapter 19, that this is the sign of tongues, whereas what we see in 1 Corinthians is the gift of tongues. And they would argue that the sign of tongues was relegated to the early church, but the gift of tongues that they see in 1 Corinthians continues on until this day. Now, we noted the historical problem with that in how the gift of tongues disappeared from church history for about 1,800 years. And so many who believe that there are modern tongues have argued that that is, in fact, historically accurate. The gift of tongues did disappear and the reason why the gift of tongues is now being manifest in the church is because the end times are here and the gift of tongues is one of the signs to usher in the time of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Except we don't see that in the New Testament. That's an inference that they are drawing. What we do see is not that the gifts in scripture, usher in the kingdom, but they are present when the kingdom is here. In other words, they do not precede the coming of the kingdom, but they are testimony that the kingdom is, in fact, here. And we'll come back to this one, because this is a more modern argument, and it does have some teeth to it. What we see, however, in the New Testament concerning Acts and 1 Corinthians is that the language is identical. Both of them describe the speaking in tongues with the same language. They use the verb to speak, leleo, and they use the word for language or tongue, glossa, usually in the plural. And remember, if you go and look through the use of the word tongue, in the ancient world, it was used in three different ways. It was used of the organ in our mouth, the physical tongue. It was used of something that was tongue-shaped, or it referred to real human languages. Nowhere do we find that it ever meant ecstatic utterance, or gibberish, or some language that is non-cognitive, non-communicable, 
It always refers to real human languages that somebody spoke at some time. They may be dead languages now that nobody speaks, but they are real languages nonetheless. That's how the word is used, not only in the New Testament, the Old Testament, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, but in Old Testament or in, in literature of the biblical period, in, in, other, in other nations. It's consistent. In fact, when they're talking about jitter, gibberish or ecstatic utterances, there actually are terms in Hebrew and Greek that refer to such things, and they're not used in Acts for the gift of tongues or in 1 Corinthians. In other words, the vocabulary was available if that's what they were referring to. Furthermore, 1 Corinthians is written before, about five years before Acts. So Luke, who was a traveling companion of Paul's and knew about 1 Corinthians, if he's referring to something different, why doesn't he intentionally use different language to distinguish the two? But he uses exactly the same language, exactly, to speak in languages. I quoted last time from Wayne Grudem, who is a continuationist who believes that the spiritual gifts continue today with the one exception of apostles. He argues that one of the problems we have today communicating this idea is the fact that English translations continue to translate the phrase speaking in tongues when it should be speaking in languages. That's what the word means. And even though he believes and he, he's skeptical to a degree of much of the tongues today, but he argues that it is still available from time to time, that he would argue that it still should be understood as languages, not as gibberish or nonsense. It may be, according to some, a heavenly language, but it's a language nonetheless. Now, we had much more to say on that, and you can go online and, and you can watch that sermon to get more of the details. But we came to the conclusion that the tongues in Acts 2 Acts 10, Acts 19 are exactly the same as the tongues in 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some more arguments that are put forward for why those gifts should not be understood as the same thing. All I did last time was compare Acts and 1 Corinthians. I noted the historical argument that in fact most people who are Pentecostal, charismatic, third waivers or the open but cautious views will acknowledge that they disappeared from history. And the two views that are given are the one that I, I just mentioned, that they've come back, they disappeared but came back to usher in the second coming of Christ or some blame the church. It was our fault. They were available, but for one reason or another, we didn't avail ourselves of that. That doesn't work well with scripture, though, because we don't see people choosing to speak in tongues. We see it coming upon them. Acts chapter 2, these people weren't planning to speak in tongues, but the Holy Spirit came down upon them, the birth of the church. They went outside and began to speak in these other languages, the dialects of these other people, 16 different languages enumerated by Luke in Acts 2. One other thing we did note, too, is the fact that the, the modern connotation of tongues as the, this non-commutative, communicative, non-cognitive um, languages, what we would call gibberish, because that's how it sounds to, to uh, the listener, because it can't be translated, because it's not something else, it's ecstatic. That this is in virtually every pagan religion in the history of the world. People have looked at ancient Greek languages, Roman languages, African language uh, religions, all these different religions, uh, modern shamanism, the occult. This type of ecstatic utterance is pervasive among pagan religion. It's everywhere. And the, and the difficulty is how do you distinguish how do you distinguish between the ecstatic utterance of Mormons? Okay, Joseph Smith encouraged Mormons 
to, to speak in tongues. There are claims within the Muslim community of speaking in tongues, within the occult, shamanism, witch doctors, African tribal religions. Are we saying that all of this is from God? Furthermore, there's the purpose of gifts that was read. It is a sign. If you read in the New Testament what a sign is, a sign is a miracle, something miraculous that happens to point to something else. In other words, if somebody supernaturally speaks in a different language, that's not what you're supposed to be looking at. You're supposed to be looking at why they're speaking in that language, why it's supernatural, what is it pointing to? And he says it's a sign to what? Unbelievers. In the book of Acts, it is primarily a sign to the Jewish people that God was now bringing the gospel not just to Jews, but to Gentiles also. So this is very pervasive, for instance, in the story of Cornelius. And we walk through this. You remember Cornelius, who's a Gentile, Peter's up on his roof. He has a vision of the sheet that comes down, all these unclean animals according to the Old Testament law. He is told to kill and eat. He says, no, he won't do it. And God says, do not deem unclean what I have deemed clean. Kill and eat. And he does it. Then somebody from Cornelius' house shows up. Peter goes to his house, shares the gospel with them. They become saved. They speak in tongues. This is probably also what's going on in Acts chapter 8 when the Samaritans first believe. You need the apostles to authenticate it so that you do not have two churches. You do not have a Jewish church and a Samaritan church, but you have one church, the body of Christ. And so uh, two apostles, they go and they share the gospel. They confirm exactly what's going on. Okay, and this happens later on with those who are disciples of John the Baptist. Again, the apostles testify to it. They speak in tongues. Now, moving on here. Many times people argue that there are different kinds of tongues, meaning there are earthly tongues, what we would call languages, so like German and French and English and Greek and Hebrew. And then there are heavenly languages, and that's what modern tongues is. We may not comprehend it. It may sound like ecstatic utterance. It may be, sound like gibberish to us, but it's some sort of heavenly language. And one of the arguments for where this comes from is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in verse 10. So I want you to look there. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10, it says this, And to another the workings of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another the distinguishing of spirits, and to someone else various kinds of tongues. Now here it doesn't tell us what those various kinds, you got to wait till we get to chapter 13 for them to pull the threads of their argument together. But what they argue is where it says various kinds or varieties, of tongues. Remember, the word tongue means here languages. And everywhere that it's used, it refers to real languages. They argue that this phrase, gene glosson, okay, glosson is the plural of glossa, tongue, so tongues, and gene is the word kinds. Now, you have probably heard of the word gene when we render it into English because we render it into English as genus. Remember way, way, way back in science class, kingdom phylum class order, family, genus, species, how Linnaeus divided everything up into classes and orders. So we get the word genus. Genus refers to families or groups or dynamics. John MacArthur um, about 40 years or more ago, wrote a book called The Charismatics. And in it, he says that the Greek word for kinds or varieties is genos, which means a family or a group or a race or a nation. 
In his more recent book, Strange Fire, he says linguists, off, linguists often refer to language families or groups, and that is precisely Paul's point. There are various families of languages in the world, and this gift enables some believers to speak in a variety of them. Gene glosson, kinds or varieties of languages, the word gene is modifying the word language. And it's saying that there are varieties or kinds or families of language. Now, Paul explains this actually in chapter 14. If you want to turn over to 14, verse 10, he uses the word gene there again. He says in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 10, there are perhaps a great many kinds of, now my translation has sounds in the world, but the word here should be translated languages in the world, and none is without meaning. So he's talking about throughout the world, there's all kinds of different languages. Now it's a different word for language there. He uses a word, the reason the, the Legacy Standard Bible translates its sounds is because the word is phone, which normally means sound, but in, on a number of occasions, the context requires that it's translated as languages, and it does here. Peter uses it in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, to refer to languages. It's used this way in the Old Testament, Genesis 11, verse 1, Deuteronomy 28, 49. It's used numerous times in the apocryphal books, especially 2 Maccabees, and the Jewish historian Josephus uses it to refer to human languages as well. So what is he saying? He says in 14 verse 10 that there are various families of languages throughout the world. But the same modifier. We've already traced that the word languages, tongues, in 1 Corinthians and in Acts, refers to real human languages. In fact, in Acts 2, it actually refers to units within a language that is specific dialects. And I mentioned that we can say Chinese, but there's all kinds of dialects within the Chinese language. Okay, Greek has numerous dialects, especially ancient Greek. And so... What he's saying here in chapter 12, verse 10, is that there are families or groupings of language. And people have the supernatural ability with this gift to speak in these different families of languages. Some might be able to speak in, in, in an African language or a European language or an Asian language, but they're able to speak within those, those families. Now, in and of itself, that is not a strong argument in favor of arguing that a variety of tongues refers to human earthly languages and then some heavenly devotional or spiritual or angelic language. What they do is they pull on that thread and they tie it to chapter 13 and verse 1, which is their next argument. They argue in chapter 13, verse 1, Paul says there, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So what they're saying is that the gift of tongues, two kinds, the gift of tongues of men, that is human languages, and the gift of the tongues of angels, these heavenly or devotional or, or prayer languages. The problem with that is they're not reading the context at all. Okay, what is the first word? If, if, look, look at the context. He says, if I speak with these, and I do not have love, I become a noisy gong and a clanging sim. And the next one, and if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. We need to look at what this means in context. The context here is about love. Okay? 
What he's doing is he's setting up a hypothetical situation. He's not telling us whether the gift of, of angels exists, uh, the, the, sorry, the, that angels have their own languages and some people are able to speak those languages. He's setting up a hyperbolic scenario, an exaggeration. Because what he's saying is, you Corinthians, if I were able to speak in the languages of angels, you would want that. Go on to the next one. You would want that. You would want that. But what you don't have is love. You want the flashy, showy stuff, but you don't have love. So it's worthless. It's meaningless. You're nothing. So the whole scenario sets up a bunch of impossibilities. If you look at what he says here, and if I have the gift of prophecy, know all mysteries. Paul didn't know all mysteries. Nobody does except God. Go on to the next one. And if I have knowledge and if I have all faith, nobody has all faith as to move, literally move mountains. Nobody. Paul didn't. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor and if I surrender my body to burn, I have none. He's setting up either hypothetical impossibilities or extremes, radical extremes of what's going on here. John Battle says this, he says, these are all examples of hyperbole, making a point by exaggeration. To apply this concept to the Corinthians, Paul uses the argument from the greater to the lesser. He recognizes that they speak with the tongues of men, but even if they spoke in the tongues of angels, they would still profit nothing without love. That's his point. Paul is not trying to inform us about the languages of angels. What he's telling them is that their priorities are misplaced. You guys all want the showy, fancy gifts, but they don't have love for one another. And we saw that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when they're celebrating the Lord's Supper. And it was so bad in their lack of love and care and concern for one another. He says, this is why some among you are sick and some have already fallen asleep. Some have already are dead. There was a serious lack of love for the brethren in the Corinthian church. They were a very self-centered church. It was a one-upmanship church. Now, E.W. Bullinger, in his authoritative book, Figures of Speech Used in the Bible, he notes that 1 Corinthians 13.1 falls within the subcategory of hyperbole known as hypotheses. Bullinger defines this subcategory as, quote, things which are impossible in themselves, but are used to express the greatness of the subject spoken of. In other words, Paul is using a figure of speech here in these verses to show a, an, an exaggeration, an extreme, to get his point across. Nathan Crockett, in his dissertation, says, Hermeneutically, it is best to understand Paul's reference to the tongues of angels as hyperbolic. In the first two verses of chapter 13, Paul speaks in hyperbole. He recognizes that no one understood all mysteries, possessed all knowledge, or had all faith, allowing one to remove mountains. The threefold use of all demonstrates Paul's hyperbole. Nobody knows all mysteries, has all knowledge, or demonstrates all faith. He argues from the greater to the lesser. Paul asked the Corinthians to imagine the most spectacular spiritual realities and abilities and to realize that even a person with those gifts would be worthless without love. Even if one could speak with an angelic tongue and did so out of any motivation other than love, such an ability would make the speaker nothing more than a noisemaker. Paul's reference to speaking with the tongues of angels should not be forced beyond its original hyperbolic intent. Now, Nathan Businich, speaking on this passage, notes, even if you agree that there are angelic languages, that they speak in a, in a non-human language, Paul here notes that this is some radical exception. It seems as though when you go through that, no one possesses that. 
So even if there are angelic languages, no one speaks them. Just as no one knows all mysteries, no one has all faith. So even if there are angelic languages that are different than ours, and we don't know this because every time angels speak in the Bible, they speak in normal human language. But if they do have their own language, Paul is saying nobody has that gift anyways. Just if they don't have the gift of all faith, all knowledge of all mysteries, and so forth. But people want to use this verse here to say that there are two types or groups of tongues. There are heavenly tongues, these prayer tongues, uh, and, and so forth. And that's not what Paul's point is about. And he spends an entire chapter dealing with love, which is the focus. The focus here isn't on tongues at all. And again, if there is such thing as the tongues of, of angels, nobody speaks them. Nobody. And there's one more point that we'll, we'll pull out here. Um, in our next argument. If you turn to chapter 14, and this is the next thread, it says, verse 1, Pursue love, yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. By the way, just as a, 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 an aside here, I would mentioned a number of weeks ago that I would answer the question, when Paul talks about the fact that the Holy Spirit is the one who distributes the gifts according to his will, and yet it says in at the end of chapter 12, and it says here in, in one or two other places, about earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you would prophesy. Well, if the Spirit gives them according to his will, why are we seeking after these? The best answer and the most common answer given by scholars throughout church history is that when they're talking about e eagerly desiring, it's in a corporate context. In other words, not that you individually are desirous or, or should be desirous of tongues or prophecy or something else, but you should desire that those gifts are within your church because the gifts are for the building up of the body. And if the body lacks certain spiritual gifts, then the body will be lacking in that local manifestation. So when he talks about desiring... We should desire that at Unionville Baptist Church, all the gifts of the Spirit that are presently available, that they would be present here in abundance because we all benefit. And to go back to where we started with this in Romans chapter 12, remember, whatever your gift or gifts are, use them. Paul says, if you have this gift, use it. If you have this gift, use it. If you have this gift, use it. Four times. So if you have the gift of help, some mercy or administration, if you have the gift of teaching, use those gifts for the benefit of the body of Christ. I depend on you. I need your gifting to build me up in the faith. And it should be likewise throughout, throughout the congregation. We all literally need one another. That's so important why we gather together. We don't gather together on Sunday just because Hebrews says, do not forsake the assembling together as some are in the habit of doing. We gather together because we need one another. We come to worship God. Yes, that's our ultimate priority. But we also come to minister to one another. To equip one another for the work of ministry is not just, you know, getting your, your assignment and your, and your skills to do, to do, you know, evangelism and so forth. It's so that you would be able to live godly and rightly in this world. And we depend on one another. And when you come, you come to exercise your gifting and share it with the rest so that we're all blessed. But as we go on in, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2 says, For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Unfortunately, many people stop reading there. What they're arguing is that there is a devotional type of prayer, a, a tongues as a, as a um, heavenly language, and it's spoken to God. Uh, I've, I've known people over the years who have told me that they, they pray in tongues. Tongues. 
This text here, when it says they prayed to God, is completely ripped out of context. Just keep reading. Why is it that when they speak in tongues, that they speak to God alone? It's because nobody knows what they're saying because there's no interpreter. So later on in the chapter, he says, keep silent. Most of the tongues that goes on in churches today is not interpreted. It's just people speaking in, in tongues. And yet we are told that the purposes of tongues are as a sign for unbelievers. In other words, it's an opening for the gospel to be shared. Acts chapter 2, they, they, they come out, they begin to speak in tongues. People are wondering what's going on. Some say, I hear my own language. Others are saying they're drunk because none of those languages are one that they know. And what does Peter do with it? He shares the gospel. 3,000 people are saved that day. It was a sign. So it's a sign so that the gospel is shared. Somebody comes in, they go, hey, what's going on? That person doesn't know that language. What's going on? This person, hey, they don't know it either. And they have received something from God. And it's used as an opportunity to say, see, the Lord is at work. He is mighty in power. Can I share the gospel? That's what it is. It's a sign for unbelievers so that you would have an opportunity to share the gospel. In fact, when things are done earlier, orderly, 1 Corinthians 14 says that the unbeliever who comes in will leave having said that indeed the Lord has been in this place. It's a sign of the reality of God and the power of God and the truth of the gospel. Not only that is it for an opportunity, a sign, but it's for the building up of the body of Christ. If people are just speaking in languages and nobody has any idea what's going on, how does that build you up in the faith? Hey, if Lavinia begins speaking in... in uh, a native language, and I have no idea what she's talking about. That doesn't edify me. That might pique my curiosity or something of what she's saying, but that's not going to build me up. And if there's never any interpreter, we all know that languages that we cannot comprehend, they, they just, there's no familiarity. It's just noise. So these things were given for a purpose, not just so that people could go around doing certain things. They were never for the individual. So he says here, for the one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Why? For no one understands. But in his spirit, he speaks mysteries. But the one who prophesies speaks to men for edification, exhortation, encouragement. The one who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. But I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but even more that you would prophesy. And greater is one who prophesies than the one who speaks in a tongue, unless he translates. Tongues, Paul says, is worthless without interpretation. People need to know what it is that you're saying. And by the way, in, in the book of Acts, tongue seems to be a subcategory of prophecy. So what is it that somebody is speaking in a different language? They're not saying the national anthem. They're sharing something that God has supernaturally given them for the benefit of the church, and he does it in this supernatural way so that the, the, the way it's given acts as a sign to the message. It's the message that's important. The sign points to the message. But if somebody's just talking and nobody knows what they're saying, there's no message, it's no longer a sign. It's worthless. That's why later on he says, you know what? No interpreter, sit there and be quiet. So just these, and I'm going to give you what I think is the strongest argument. It's a more modern one. 
when we look at tongues, just, just from the Bible, okay, we're not looking at anybody's experience or that, but we're, we're looking, what does the Bible say? The arguments that are levied are, number one, the most common argument is that the tongues in Acts is not the same as the tongues in 1 Corinthians. What is the evidence? There isn't any. There, there just isn't. All, the, all the, the, the clues that we have show that they're talking about the same thing. They use the same vocabulary. Both of them have people understanding it, either in their, it, because it's their own native dialect or somebody interprets it. In both contexts, it's a sign. Everything points that they're in parallel, not in contrast. They're not two different things. We looked just now at uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 2, where it says that there are kinds of tongues, and the specific word for kinds there means families or groupings. It's not talking about that there's human languages or, or heavenly languages. There's Nobody reading that would come up with that apart from chapter 13, verse 1, but we looked at that in context. And that in context is if I could. But just like the other three, nobody does. So even if there are angelic languages, Paul is saying none of us speak them, even in the gifting of tongues. And finally, we just looked in chapter 14, verse 2, where he says about speaking to God rather than men. If you read through the rest of it in the context, the reason it says that they only speak to God is because God understands because he gave them the message in the first place. But nobody else understands because nobody's there to translate for them. Now, one last argument. This one, this one here is potentially a solid argument, although I'm going to argue that it's not. I've mentioned before, and, and we'll be done with tongues today, but I mentioned that with, with the spiritual gifts that historically in the modern age, these began in 1901. Okay, so in 1901, on January 1st, 1901, a woman named Agnes Osman was the first person to speak in tongues. She apparently spoke in, in Chinese. She wrote in Chinese. If you want to know her Chinese, go and you can Google it because they published her writings in newspapers and we still have them to this day and they don't look anything like Chinese. It's chicken scratch at best. But they claimed that she could speak in tongues. This is where it began. Okay, Before that, you have roughly 1,800 years of silence, except in some heretical groups from time to time. It's still popping up in pagan religions and the occult, but in mainstream Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, roughly 1,800 years, it's gone. And it pops up in, and remember, they believed that tongues in Acts and 1 Corinthians were real human languages. So what did they do? They sent off missionaries to India and Japan and, and other places, and they, and they said, you know what? These people don't need to learn it the traditional way. We'll send them. They'll have the gift of tongues, and everybody's going to understand what they're saying. They all came back. Didn't work. So they had two choices. Do we believe our experience that we're speaking in tongues, or do we reinterpret Scripture? And they reinterpreted Scripture. They now said that the modern manifestation of tongues is in this heavenly language and it's not real human languages. So they changed the traditional understanding of tongues in scripture, which was universally understood throughout church history to refer to real human languages. But it starts in 1901. 
and then it, it spreads through. Now, we said historically there was the first wave, which was Pentecostalism. Okay, so Pentecostalism starts in 1901, and really it starts about five years later when uh, uh, the, a so-called uh, miraculous revival begins at, at Azusa Street. Um, but then you have the next wave that comes, which we call the charismatic renewal or the charismatic movement. And then it really, really moves within evangelicalism, the conservative Christian church, in what's called the third wave. And what distinguished the third wave, if you remember, is they, they didn't believe that being baptized with the Holy Spirit was a later phenomenon, but that baptism with the Holy Spirit, rightly, biblically, begins at the moment of conversion. So there was a subtle shift there. And then there's a modern movement called the open but cautious movement. In other words, they would say much, much of what's going on is not biblical, but they still believe that uh, all of the gifts except the gift of apostles, there's a few that believe that apostles are still here, but most would say that at least one spiritual gift came to an end, that is the gift of the apostles. Within the open but cautious view, there's a, an argument based upon Joel chapter 2. You remember Joel chapter 2 is quoted in Acts chapter 2. So Peter's going to explain to the people what's going on. And so in Acts chapter 2, he quotes Joel chapter 2. And there are different interpretations theologically of what's going on here. But Peter, when he quotes Joel chapter 2, and he does that, he says, verse 16, but this is what was spoken, or this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel, and it shall come to be in the last days, God says, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, even on my male slaves and female slaves, I will in those days pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy and I will put my wonders in the sky above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and great and awesome day of the Lord comes and it will be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you go back into the actual book of Joel, chapter 2, you find out the chronological context that he's talking about. And he's talking about events that proceed just before the second coming of Christ, before the establishment of the millennial kingdom, and then those events that will happen in the millennial kingdom. He does it in reverse order. So in the original context of Joel chapter 2, the timing of when these things transpire is at the second coming of Christ. So you have a few choices here exegetically. You could argue that God somehow changed the timing. So for instance, Bruce Walke argues that the first part, when it says this is what was spoken of, he says this is all that was spoken of. In other words, a complete, total fulfillment of Joel 2 took place on the day of Pentecost. Now, I have issues with that hermeneutically because you are completely changing the prophecy. God tells us when it's going to happen, and then God changes his mind? Okay, do you see that elsewhere in prophecy? No, so why here? Second thing is, if it's all, have we seen all those things be fulfilled? Look at how it starts. I shall pour out my spirit on all flesh, literally. Has the Holy Spirit been poured out on the entire world? No, the only ones that have the spirit are true believers, those born again. But when the millennial kingdom starts, who are those that enter the kingdom? Only who? Only believers. So the Spirit of God will be poured out upon all of them because they're all believers. It's only later on when they have kids and those kids need to make a personal choice whether to be born again or not. But when the kingdom begins, 
all mankind, the Spirit of God is poured out upon them. But it certainly didn't happen on the day of Pentecost. It was only on a few. And yet it says that he will pour it out on all mankind. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall dream uh, visions and shall dream dreams. And even my male slaves and females, in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. I will put my wonders in the sky above and the signs of the earth, blood, fire, moon, and vapor. The sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood. Did that happen? No, but read the book of Revelation, you're going to see those things happening. Because in, if you read Joel, he does something interesting. It happens a few other times in the Bible. But what he does is he starts with the after and then he moves to the before. So reverse chronology. So he talks about the great and awesome day of the Lord. So the second coming of Christ. And then he talks first about things that are going to happen after. And then he moves on to what's going to happen before. Well, the book of Revelation says that just before the coming of Christ, these signs and wonders in the sky are going to happen. It's part of the judgment of God. The moon, and the, sun, the moon being turned to blood and, and the sun being super hot. and At times it's blotted out. We see all these things just prior to the coming of Christ. And the pouring out of the Spirit happens after. The problem here, folks, if you look clearly, nothing that Joel prophesied happened on the day of Pentecost. Nothing. Zero. It's not all. It's not even some. It's none. What happened on the day of Pentecost? And it's not listed here. Okay. And then the Spirit came down. On, and then what did they begin to do? They spoke in languages that they didn't previously know. Anybody see that in the Joel 2 prophecy? It doesn't mention tongues anywhere. How can you see that's a fulfillment? Nobody's prophesying. Nobody's dreaming dreams. The sun and the moon, nothing's happening there. How can Peter say, this is it? It's because he's not talking about fulfillment. He's talking about analogy. You guys want to know what's happening here? Joel talked about when there's a pouring out of the Spirit, there's going to be supernatural attendant circumstances. And he lists them. When the Spirit comes in the context of Joel 2, at the second coming of Christ, it's going to be attended by supernatural manifestations of the power of God. Dreaming dreams, prophesying, a pouring out of the Spirit on all mankind, and supernatural wonders in the heavens. This is all going to happen. So what's he saying? He's saying, you guys are seeing this, this supernatural manifestation. You should be doing the two things that we see in Joel. One, you should see that this is the miraculous outpouring of the Spirit. And two, there's a huge interlude between the prophecies in Joel 2. And it's a digression between them where he calls them to repentance. What does Peter begin to do when he shares the gospel with these people? He tells them to repent. So why go through this with you? Because there are many people who are arguing today that the kingdom has been inaugurated and much of this is going on today, but the rest is for later. Joel 2 is not teaching that at all. Joel 2 tells us what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and Peter is not contradicting what Joel said. He's not. What he's saying is this is like that. By the way, the Greek phrase that's used here, when my Bible says this is what was spoken, that this is what can be rendered all kinds of different ways, including this is like that. Because most don't want to go where Walkie goes. Okay, that's usually in the strong uh, uh, millennial camp that wants to say that all of this, that the kingdom is fully present now and all of this stuff is going on, okay? And then we have to spiritualize the signs and wonders in the heaven because they didn't happen, okay? So you have, to, you have to massage the text a little bit here. But most what they want to do is they want to have a yet not yet concept here. They want to say that it's a partial fulfillment, the rest is yet to come. But do we see even a partial fulfillment not only did Joel tell us when it's going to happen, just before the second coming of Christ and just after, 
but not one thing listed here happened then. They want to know what's going on. People spoke in tongues. Joel doesn't mention tongues. So what's the correlation? The only correlation can be at the beginning of Acts 2, where it talks about that the Spirit came. <clears throat> Verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Joel 2 talks about that the Spirit would be poured out. So what's happening? The correlation is an outpouring of the Spirit. That's what he's saying. He's saying, guys, Joel already talked about this type of thing. You know, when there's an outpouring of the Spirit, the supernatural manifestations happen. These are signs and wonders in order to point to something, to authenticate something. And Peter is saying the same thing. This is authenticating the gospel. More importantly, it's authenticating Jesus Christ. So if you believe that the kingdom is now present in some form, that is the, 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 the messianic kingdom with Christ reigning, then you have a legitimate argument because Joel said that all kinds of supernatural signs and wonders are going to happen when the kingdom is established. But I don't see Christ reigning on his throne in Jerusalem right now. Has Christ returned to establish his kingdom? Yes, he's seating at the right hand of the Father, but the kingdom is an earthly kingdom. It says that he will sit on the throne of his father who? David. Where is that kingdom? It's centered in Jerusalem. So his kingdom is future. It will be established at his second coming. He will subdue his enemies and he will establish his kingdom on this earth and he will reign on the throne of his father, David. When that comes, the Spirit is going to be poured out and there's all kinds of signs and wonders and manifestations that are going to attend to that. So let me just summarize very, very quickly. There's tons of wonderful literature on this if you, if you want to read it. The best thing, though, is just to read your Bible. Read through it very carefully. But the, the main arguments that are often given for, for tongues is, number one, experience. And we dare not say anybody's experience is invalid. We, we know that. That's, that's, you know, crossing the line. But we also know that experience isn't reliable. There's all kinds of crazy things that people have claimed to experience that we know are sheer and utter nonsense. Many claim unbelievers speaking in tongues. That doesn't fit with the scripture. They're not filled with the spirit. We know that it happens in pagan religions. It's ubiquitous throughout not only paganism, but historically throughout paganism. And even in cults, like the Mormon cult. We also know that when we look at Acts and we look at 1 Corinthians, that they're talking about the same thing that they're talking about real human languages. Not something that nobody understands but God, but real human languages. Supernaturally, God empowers them to speak in a language that they have never learned, they may have never even heard of, but somebody interprets. There must be an interpreter. We saw that 1 Corinthians Chapter 12, verse 10, when it talks about varieties or uh, genuses of languages, that's talking about groupings, family groupings. And he used the same phraseology in chapter 14, verse 10, when he talks about gene phonon. Oh, by the way, I'm not sure, I might be repeating myself. I can't remember if I mentioned. Why does he mention gene glosson? Okay, varieties are kinds of tongues. And then he goes on and says varieties of sounds or languages. Why change the language? Most likely what he's doing is in 1 Corinthians 14.10, he's talking about naturally learned languages. 
So I know one language, English. Still working on it. But I learned English. I wasn't born speaking English, that some supernatural thing that God gave me that I had to learn it. So he's choosing a word that means language. It's not the common one, but he's using it to distinguish the two. Gene Gloson is a supernatural ability to speak in a language that one did not learn through the natural process. Okay, Gene Phonon is a naturally learned language. Okay, it's the context that makes us interpret it this way. Okay, so 1 Corinthians 12 doesn't support speaking in tongues as being different. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, even if I speak in the tongue of men or angels, the context doesn't, doesn't tell us whether angels have their own language or not, and it certainly doesn't imply that somebody has the gift to speak it. Again, if, 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 and all the other ones is if, but nobody does, nobody can. It's impossible. So Paul isn't saying that some people speak in the gift of angels. Really, in context, he's saying nobody does. Okay, and then finally, um, we looked at 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2, where he says, they do not speak to men but to God. That the context says the only reason they speak to God is because nobody interprets, therefore it's useless. Because nobody understands, it doesn't edify the church. So that person should be silent. And then finally, tongues as kingdom markers. If the kingdom is in fact present, then we should expect signs and wonders and the supernatural, perhaps even including tongues. But the kingdom is not here because the king is not here. When the king comes back, he will establish his throne. He will separate the sheep from, from the goats. He will separate the wheat from the chaff, and he will establish his kingdom on the earth. And Revelation chapter 20 says that he will reign for a thousand years upon the earth before the great white throne judgment and establishing his eternal kingdom on the new earth. So my point of view, scripturally, when I read the scriptures, I do not see the modern manifestation of tongues as being equivalent to biblical tongues. Whatever it is, it's something else. I don't see it in scripture, therefore I can't promote it as being something that's from God because there's no way to validate that it is from God. It's unprecedented. And therefore nobody should pursue it. And if they're overwhelmed by something, they need to evaluate and find out why they did what they did. Is it emotionalism? Is it something else? But search the scriptures. Whatever it is we are talking about, it doesn't matter. Experience can never be in authority over scripture. It cannot. Scripture is authoritative and 100% trustworthy because it comes directly from God. Our experience is not trustworthy at all. And so, my experience must give way to the text of Scripture. Okay, be a good Berean, go home, search these things, see if they be true. But make sure that whatever conclusion you come to is based solely on what the text teaches. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. And Lord, once again, we pray for humility as we would study. These are things, Lord, that godly men and women completely and utterly disagree on, emphatically. And so, Lord, may we not sit in condemnation or judgment over others, but, Lord, seek to be faithful to what the Scriptures say, that we would be that, that man, that woman, who is not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, Lord, may we be men and women, boys and girls of the word, that it would be in authority, that we would remember, as the scriptures tell us, that, when, that we would receive the Bible for what it is, the very word of God. It is God-breathed, and it carries the one authority that God has supreme. So, Lord, may we search diligently, not uh, coming to the conclusions that we want, but to go and find the conclusions that you have drawn in your word. Above all things, Lord, we remember that these gifts have been given for the use for us to build up others.
and for the advancement of the gospel. So, Lord, may we be people that are so, so concerned with building up our brothers and sisters in the faith, encouraging them and, and teaching them and using the gifts that you give us, Lord, that they would be more like Jesus Christ, even as we pursue Christ. And also, Lord, may we be ever concerned with the souls of those who are without Christ, those on that broad road destruction. May we, as Jews said, set, snatch them from the fire. So, Lord, may we not be those who are self-seeking people, but those filled with the love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13 a love that puts the needs of everyone above ourselves. In fact, that we would love even as you have loved. So Lord, bless your people, bless us. We need that blessing desperately, Lord. So speak into our hearts and our lives. May that living word shape us and conform us to the image of Jesus Christ, our Savior, in whose precious name we pray, amen.